It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Beth Hiley. In Sealand, you are a group of merchants who are from the Netherlands and you are attempting to cultivate this very marshy dike area here. And in doing so, you're going to get victory points. The person with the most victory points is going to be the winner. Now there's a great diagram in the rules of how to set up this uh, circular area here. So I would just refer to that to get that set up. But each player should have a pawn marker of their color sitting on this last golden disc here. Now, what you also need to get the game started is you need to seed the board with these marshy areas. So there's a whole pile of these in the box, and there's little icons here so you know where to put them. You're just going to randomly lay them out on these correct spots. Each player also starts with four windmills in their color, and they're going to randomly place them on a spot of their choice on these little starting windmill spots here. And then finally, each player starts with one coin in their possession as well. And we'll describe what that does in a little bit. There are two halves to every person's turn. First, you're going to acquire a tile from this middle ring here. And second, you're gonna place that tile somewhere on the board. So first, we're gonna talk about acquiring tiles. Players are either going to be uh, gaining m construction tiles here. That's where you get to build a spot for one of your windmills or you're going to be buying some seeds. There are three different colors of seeds. There are the black cabbages, the yellow rape seeds, and the red tulips. Now, I'm not going to be turning in any money to purchase these tiles. Rather, I'm going to potentially be moving along this golden coin track here. So I'm going to start wherever this black pawn is. And the rule, it's, rules is called the Guildmaster. I can buy the space in front of the Guildmaster for free. So I can just say, I want that tile. And then I would go place that tile on the board. But let's say I see a really fantastically awesome yellow seven here, and I really want that tile. Well, that is two in front of the one that I'm entitled to get for free. So I can go claim that tile, but I am going to move up two spaces along this golden coin track. And then I would take this tile and place it on the board. Anytime you have an empty hole here, you're going to fill it in with the appropriate type. So the spots are marked with pictures of what kind of tile you should replace. So this happens to be another mill construction tile. Now let's say as we go through a couple of rounds and people are buying tiles and um, they might be skipping ahead a lot. And you might find, let's say the gray player here really wants to buy this yellow three. But to do so requires him to skip one, two, three, four, five spaces. And unfortunately, he only can skip one, two, three, four spaces ahead. So this track does limit how far around this inner wheel that you can go. Likewise, if someone is at the very end of that golden coin track, they are not going to be able to skip at all because there's no place for them to go. Now, as people are skipping and they end up at different points along this golden coin track, as soon as nobody is, in the, uh, is on the last space here, we've all moved ahead, that one in from behind is going to flip around to the front. Now giving the gray player here a little breathing room to skip at least one tile. And these will continually follow us and drift around this outer circle. Now before we talk about placing tiles, there's one other spot here on this circular track. And that is the warehouse. It's got a big negative three printed on it. Now the warehouse, sometimes you can't help but be forced to land on it. Example, I'm the orange player again and I cannot skip any spots. I have nowhere else to expand up to on this track. So I'm forced to take the one right in front for three. And unfortunately, this spot right in front of me that I can get for free is the warehouse. Two things happen. First, I lose three points for my total score as measured by the track around the edge of the board. And then I'm able to move my pawn three spaces backwards along this outer track. One, two, three. 
and that then gives me a little bit more breathing room, hopefully to get a tile that's much more advantageous next turn. Now we're gonna talk about placing tiles. Now you know from acquiring tiles at the beginning of your turn that there's two major types. There are seeds, which come in three different colors, and then mills. First we're gonna look at seeds. When you get a seed tile, you're gonna have to place it next to a mill of your color. So I have three choices here of where I can place this set ye yellow seven. And once you find the spot you like, you can just flip it over to indicate that you're done. And that would be the end of your turn. Now a mill tile just has to go next to some other cultivated tile. So seeds are cultivated tiles, other mills are cultivated tiles, and farms, which we're gonna look at in a minute. So it basically just has to go next to another flip up tile. So I might choose to place a mill over here. Now, if there's any of these face down tiles, whenever a mill appears, because the mill is there to help drain water, it's gonna flip over and reveal any of these tiles that are immediately adjacent to it. And then, since I acquired this on my turn, I'm going to place one of my mills on it. So now I have two opportunities to generate points on this board. Now in our example here, there are two special kind of tiles that came out when we flipped over those random tiles, when we drained the area around our mill. So first of all, there's a farm. Farms are always worth zero points, but they do gain you one of these little coins. You started the game with one of these. So farms are how you acquire more of these points. And again, we'll talk about those in a moment. You'll notice here on this uh, six yellow that there's a little symbol of a black pawn. And there are a number of these included with the game. If I am the one to reveal that tile, then I'm gonna place one of those black pawns next to my windmill. Now this pawn is called a governor, and it is considered part of the advanced game, so you can actually play without the governors if you choose. Governors are going to affect your scoring, so we're gonna talk about that next. Scoring happens at the end of someone's turn only if one of their mills is completely surrounded by tiles. So in this case, this mill is not completely surrounded, but this one is. So I would score just this mill. Now I'm just gonna add up all the values, seven plus three plus five plus five, for a total of 20 points, which I would mark using the score track around the edge of the board. Now there is a catch to that, however. If your mill is completely surrounded by tiles that are all of the same color, unfortunately, that mill is going to be worth zero. So you wanna make sure you get a little variety in there. The reverse is true as well. You're going to get a bonus if you can get one of each, like that. So in this case, I would add up all the printed values that I see around that mill and then give myself a bonus five points. Now the governor adds one more twist to scoring. So in this case, this mill is now completely surrounded and is ready to be scored at the very end of my turn. But it has a governor present, so that means that I have to reach a certain target of points or I'm gonna be penalized. So I'm gonna add up all of my points, including the mill spot where my mill is standing, just as I normally would, and then I'm gonna compare that total to a total that's here on the circular market track. So this is our last golden coin. This is the very top end of our buying track. The next empty space gives me the target number that I need to obtain in order to get the bonus from the governor. And this number here is, is 20 points. So hopefully my grouping here is worth 20 or more points. If it's more than that target amount, I get a bonus five points. If it's less than that target amount, I get negative five points. And keep in mind that this value may change as the coins are shuffled about as we're buying. This next value is now 28, so a much harder level to obtain. So keep that in mind when you're getting ready to finish off one of these mills that has a governor paired with it. If you're lucky enough to get some of these coins throughout the game, they allow you to have an extra turn. You're only allowed to use one at the end of your turn, but you can basically do your entire turn again and do something different. So used in the correct time, they can be incredibly powerful. And just a reminder that you gain more of these by flipping over farm tiles when you place a new windmill. Now, there are two other things to consider when you're getting near the end of the game. Now, we've already talked about how you acquire governors. Whether you get the bonus from them or not, when you clear that mill, you're going to take that governor back to your part of the board. 
Whoever has the most governors at the end of the game is going to get a 10 point bonus. Now finally, there's also these little high water marks, these little tokens. There's two in your player color. Whenever you score a mill, you have a one time chance to place this out on the score track. So if I had a really, really high scoring mill, and let's say I scored 32 points from one mill, I could place this out on the 32 spot on the track and say, I think this is going to be one of the best, highest point turns in the game. At the end of the game, whosever high watermark, whoever's token here, was placed at the highest spot along the score track is going to get a bonus of 20 points. Whoever has the second highest high watermark is going to get 15 points, third is 10 points, and fourth is 5 points. And it's entirely possible that you could score two of those bonuses, which does net a lot of extra points at the end of the game. Well, that's a quick overview of Sealand. Now, as I've mentioned before, this does have a family version. The board is double-sided, so you can flip it over and it will take out a few of the elements, like the governor, to make it a little bit easier for new players to learn, which makes this a really great family game. So, it's also really enjoyable for an experienced game by keeping it on the original side, which we've already looked at. So, this is definitely one that's worth checking out. Now, I love to give some recommendations at the end of an overview, and I have to say there's not a lot of Dutch farming games out there, but there are a lot of other games where you get to expand across the map that are known for being very easy to learn and play in under an hour. And they are Asara, which is one of my favorite games from this summer, which we've also done a video tutorial for. And you are building towers in Asara, and the biggest towers, the best towers, and possibly the most towers are going to net you the most points. Now, if you like something that requires some map skills, as you get with Sealand, then you might want to check out Finca, which has some of the best wooden fruit pieces I've ever seen, or fruples for those who are familiar with meeple terminology and you are, have a similar dial mechanism too for, to decide what action you're going to take this turn. So this is another one that's got a couple elements but are done very simply and very cleanly. And finally, you might want to check out La Strada, which is a Martin Wallace game who's known for doing very complicated, meaty, multi-hour games. This is a very simple, clean version of a train game where you're going to be building roads across a landscape. The different kinds of landscapes are more expensive than others. So you get the feeling in Sealand that you are expanding across a map and trying to connect things. But it also plays in about an hour. So all of these are available as always here at Cat and Mouse and we hope that you stop by and talk to us or give one a try. Thanks for watching our review today. For more information about board games, as well as the number one board game audio podcast, check out Dicetower.com for reviews, interviews, and more. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.